All righty. Shabbat Shalom. What an exciting day it's already been for us. Uh, you know, the Ruach is moving. You know, worship is on our hearts and our minds. And now we're going to, you know, look into the scriptures and pick back up where Yahushua is speaking to us. You know, there was a, a story that he was talking, that he began this with. And now this is continuing in our studies that we've been doing this for weeks now, but it's leading up to, you know, he's talking about this, you know, this dishonest manager and, and, and the, and the use of, and the stewardship, if you will, of, of what you, who has, has given to us as his children. And now there's a section that we're going to get, uh, continue in here, which is, you know, the law of the kingdom of, of Yahuwah, of Alehim. And so, Brother JP, if you will, uh, let's go ahead and pick up here and let's see what it has to say to us. I'm going to switch this over to, uh, uh, there's a reason I'm going to go back and forth to these different uh, kinds of tra um, translations. So if you will, go ahead, brother, and uh, start in 14 for us. Hallelujah. This is Luke chapter 16, starting at verse 14. And the Pharisees also, who were covetous, heard all these things, and they derided him. And he said unto them, You are they which justify yourselves before men, but Elohim knows your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of Elohim. The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of Elohim is preached, and every man presses into it. And it is easier for heaven and earth to pass than one tittle of the law to fail. Whosoever puts away his wife and marries another commits adultery. And whosoever marries her that is put away from her husband commits adultery. Hallelujah. All right. What you see, brother? What's, he, what's being revealed here to you? Uh, well, I like that verse here. The, the verse that says that it is easier for heaven and earth to pass than one tittle of the law to fail. Uh, it just really magnifies Yahuwah's instructions that are for our good as a, as a creation, you know, as a people of a creation that the creator has given us instructions or directions, you know, to walk in, to live in, to talk, how to eat. What's good for us, such a, a great father. And, and how important that is, that it, it can't go away. Even it says it's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than one of those to, to fail. And it just makes me think about all of the, even in, you know, even in the science world, they'll, they'll speak in that way of, you know, there's all these laws they have that justify reasoning within their community and I believe within those that read the Bible, um, we justify ourselves by saying, "Well, this is the this is the way you have to walk, and this is the way you have to talk." It's not a it's not a nothing else but pure love from Yahuwah. So, Hallelujah. This is getting to the nuts and bolts of our walk, if you will. You know, he's speaking, uh, he's been speaking to, you know, those that are around here or, or that are with him, these Pharisees, you know, the, uh, these uh, lawyers, if you will, of the law, the, 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 the understand the law, but they're not really doers of the law, I guess you could say, you know, in a sense, they're, yeah, I guess you got to look at it in the minds of these people. He's speaking them and he's, and he's revealing some things right in the very beginning. And it, and it says here in this translation, it says that the Pharisees who love the silver, but really what this word here is, if you look at it in the, in the Strong's, um, this is more like covenant. You know, he's speaking to them because of their lovers of silver, of course, uh, the positions, authority, but they're, 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 they're um, their covetous uh, in their hearts is what he's speaking to here. And, and so he begins this whole part of the law of the kingdom of Elohim with speaking to their hearts and, and, and he's breaking down the commandments. You know, these are the things that you and I are going to be judged according to. 
according to scripture. This is our righteousness here. And so he's speaking to their righteousness right here, and he begins it, and, and he ends it in the segment that we've run, uh, that we've read here with parts of, of the Tanakh. You know, these things are, and, as in, and it's all wound up or centered around, if you will, what it says in verse 17 about the Torah being done away with. You know, this is something that's, that's taught in the churches about this Torah is not for uh, them and that it's been done away with. But we can see this is very clear in his words of what he's telling us and what he's telling the Pharisees and uh, in, in in those that are listening and hearing him. He's speaking to the hearts of the men, which he's saying here. He says, you know, these Pharisees, they have covetousness in their hearts, also heard this. And what are they? They begin to sneer at him. They begin to raise their, their, their nose to him, you know, like, like who, who are you talking to? And he said to them, you are those who declare yourself righteous before men, but Elohim knows your hearts. Because what is highly thought of amongst men is an abomination in the sight of Elohim. So those things which we think are our acts of, of righteousness and in our position of, of kadoshness in the eyes of people, you know, and this is speaking to these leaders here. So it's also, therefore, speaking to us as leaders that those that are put in this position to be able to teach and that you have to look at what he's speaking to us. You know, these things are very clear. He understands the hearts. He's looking at you and I's hearts, no matter our position in the kingdom. You know, he's looking at your heart. You know, so if we're trying to exalt ourselves as what we see the Pharisees have done in our studies and how he's brought them down and he's how he's trying to show them the errors of their way so that they can change is his whole purpose of doing all these things. But he's telling us even the things that men will praise you for and think that you are, you know, uh, kadosh or righteous, if you will, in their eyes, that isn't even good enough in Yahuwah's eyes. They're abomination. Because they're not doing things appropriately to, according to the scriptures. And that's what our aim is here, because we don't want to become what that is describing there. See, the Torah and the prophets are, are in existence. They, they don't stop all the way up until Yehokanan. You know, since then, the reign of Elohim is being announced. It's being revealed. So, so that we, you know, the lay understander, if you will, the lay believer would be able to understand these things. But people, the, these men have complicated it in the churches, the religions. All of these people have complicated this so much. They put so much and they've added so much to the Torah that it's made it complicated for people to want to try to even be able to follow it. We got to strip it back to that. But there's some side notes here that I wanted to take a look at that I thought were very interesting about uh, this verse 16, which we find in Ezekiel 22, 26. All right, why is that not popping up there? All right, let me go here. So it says, her priests have done violence to my teaching and they profane my set apart matters. They have not distinguished between the set apart or the kadosh and the profane, nor have they made known the difference between the unclean and the clean. And I know Brother Rod has talked about this in some of the studies what we've been doing in the Tanakh. So maybe you'll be able to share some of that about what they're talking about here a little bit, Brother Rod, when we get into this part. But and it says, and they have hidden their eyes from my Sabbath, and I have profaned, and, and I am profaned in their midst. You know, if we look at what is this is really saying, you know, and what is it linking to? Because this is only one of the other uh, references here that we have to the same, you know, part of scripture. Where did I go here? Oh, I went the wrong way, I think. Okay, I don't know why I didn't go back to where I was. All right, anyways. So we're going to have to get back to that part of, of, of the, that was in Luke 16. Oh, that's crazy. Usually it goes backwards when I click on that. It's, it's right there, Rock, in the, in the cross-reference, Luke 16, 16, on the 22, 30, 26 of Ezekiel. Okay, 16, 16, yeah, right, exactly. Go ahead, if you will, brother, while I get back to this real quick. 
Okay, there oh, we go. No. Oh, Zephaniah, yeah. Zephaniah 3-4, there we go. For some reason, it had a freak out moment there. But anyways, our other Croft reference that we want to look at here is Zephaniah 3-4 says, her priests are, are red, uh, reckless, treacherous men. Her priests have profaned the set-apart place, and they have done violence to the Torah. You know, there's been a lot of violence done to this, but he, he, but he makes it very clear here. You know, he says it's easier for the Shemayim and the earth to pass away. Has it passed away yet? No, it's still here. We still reside with the same Shemayim and the same earth. So therefore, not one little tittle of the Torah shall fail. Everything, there's, there should not be any changes, no added, no, no taking away. But it's, it's telling us that the Torah is secure. It is our foundation. It is not going to fall. It is not going to fail. So we need to look at, you know, what is, what is Yahusha telling us? And then he goes and he finalizes this here. He says, with, with marriage and that covenant, because this is a marriage covenant that we have also, you know, in dealing with him, there's a covenant that's been established with us. So it's, it's in the same regards. And it says, everyone that's putting away his wife and marrying another commits adultery. You know, he's taking us back to Deuteronomy. Where does, what, what is this talking about? And everyone marrying her who is put away from her husband commits adultery. So he's bringing us back and reminding us the, the seriousness of the Torah, of the law that, that has been established within, you know, the, the Tanakh. It's, it's given us our guidelines. It's given our directions. You know, and this is a hard one for people to look at because there is a lot of divorce in, in our day and as there was even in those days, but putting away, you know, uh, is, is another, it's not really giving her a bill of divorce in that sense. She's still committed to this, to this one that she's married to and he's committed to her because there hasn't been a, a proper uh, way that Yahuwah has outlined that he would even consider divorce as being acceptable here. So a putting away is a, is, a, is a little bit of a different scenario. You know, if you're looking at the terminologies in the Tanakh, you know, and I look forward to having this discussion a little bit about this portion of scripture before we really get into the last portion, which is really going to give, uh, bring it all home for us. So uh, with that being said, I'm looking forward to, uh, Brother Rod, are you th there with us? I uh, wanted to get your thoughts on what we were talking about a little earlier, and I don't know if he's here. I don't see him. Okay, well, I was looking forward to having that that discussion with him on that. But go ahead, Brother JP, what you got? Yeah, hallelujah. I, I really, you know, was just kept magnifying that verse in verse 15 um, that Yahushua, he says, you are they which justify yourselves before men, but Elohim knows your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of Elohim. I, I think the, the ISR had said, um, it said something about righteousness as well in there in that translation. But I, I really think that's a it's a powerful verse that we see the Pharisees, whether it's then or it's now, or or people who walk in a in a way like that, they justify themselves before men and they forget that. It says here, Elohim knows your hearts. He knows the true you. Um, no matter how clean you make your cup, you could still be filthy inside. No matter, you, you could fool the world and, and people around you, whether you're in an assembly, a church, congregation, whatever you know, you're a part of, you can fool the people. And, but Elohim still knows your heart. And regardless of that, and so we're, we're going to be facing um, Yahusha, it says he's going to be the judge, I believe, in Revelation. And, and again, those, those words, um, the brother told me, you know, he reminded me, the brother reminded me in a conversation, we don't want to hear those words, I never knew you. So, hallelujah, hallelujah. There definitely is some words that we don't want to hear. But, you know, he, he's, he's trying to bring to light to them the, the, 
all of this is centered around the commandments that he has given to us. And, and you know, they've gotten their own style of beliefs, if you will, the, the traditions and the doctrines of men that have been handed down, you know, that the, how they declare themselves, uh, you know, you know, uh, righteous, even though they're, they're, Yahushua's calling them vile and, and dirty on the inside, you know, and it comes down to their hearts again, exactly what you were just talking about here and, and how they, they've kind of used a, a twisted or, 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 or perverted, if you will, the, the scriptures and they've, they've discounted some of them, you know, and divorce and remarriage was one of those areas where, you know, we see that the, the, this is something that they've kind of discarded a little bit because they really, um, for their own good or for their own uses, if you will, you know, so they're not really looking at this in the sense that, that, that they should be, you know, and the seriousness of this, of this vow that they have made, you know, uh, in this covenant relationship is what he's trying to bring in the kingdom uh, of Yahuwah is, is, is right in that same regard, you know, you know, it's a covenant relationship that we have with the father. And, and even with the son, you know, the, the, the covenant that he's established with us now, you know, this new covenant uh, that's centered around Amuna and, you know, in even grace and all of the things that, that we see that are written and captured in the Brit Hadashah, but the, the, the foundation of our belief never changes, you know, and that is the, 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 the foundation of the Torah or the law, if you want to say it in those, in those terms. I don't like to use that word law because I think it brings a wrong connotation to, to what that really represents. It's more of our guidelines. It's our, more of our instructions for life. You know, uh, when you put a law, you know, it's, a, it's something that, you know, most people don't like laws that are, you know, refine them, you know, laws, even that we have in, in our societies today, you know, people break them all the time, you know, because there's no respect for that. But this is not really what, you know, it gives us our do's and our don'ts because it's he's the father's loving and caring. So he's trying to give us that structure of how to live a healthy life by eating right, you know, the clean life, you know, the clean lifestyle, the clean diet that he's illustrated in his Tanakh, you know, the same thing. It goes back to that again. All of these things that he's outlined for us are for our own good, you know, and if we would just heed to the teachings and understand that that's our foundation and everything else is built upon that, that'll bring us into a refinement of, of what it is that our, our walk really is, is supposed to resemble, you know, and he's telling us here in, in these scriptures, you know, what it is to, to, to be in the kingdom of, of Elohim, you know, uh, what are the laws, what are re required of you? You know, these are the things that really should matter to you and I. When we're looking at these scriptures, they should be giving us a direction, a guideline. So, you know, if we're looking at that way, then we can allow it to affect our lives because, you know, that's how our minds are transformed by the renewing of our minds through this word. You know, the scriptures is what renews our minds to the Father's way, you know. And that's what he's really saying to us here is that these teachings that, that, that these Pharisees have uh, that are really teaching are outside of the bounds of the scriptures. And he's trying to bring them back where they're lacking. And it is the righteousness of these keeping of these commandments. Those are the things that he's really honing in on here. So uh, brother Charles, what you got, what you see? Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. You hear me? Yes. Yeah. I would like to say, um, I would just talk to the radio station and um, I noticed I was telling them something that I ain't even realized I was saying. Once a, once a people is a people, you have to govern them by law because without a law, you just keep changing everything. People can just do whatever they want to do. So Yah made him a people. So he had to govern them by his law, which is his word to me, you know, but it can be broken down. You, you all are better for explaining that to me. But um, I just want to share a couple of verses real quick. Isaiah 51, 6, it says, lift up your eyes to the Shamaim heavens and look on the earth beneath for the Shamaim will vanish away like smoke. The earth will grow old like a garment and those who dwell in it will die in the like manner. And by, and, but my salvation will be forever and my righteousness will not be abolished. So, you know, the word, the law is righteous, but um, the people will live forever but the earth will pass away. Once the people get, get with him, 
the people will live forever, but that earth will pass away. But his law and his word will never vanish still. You know what I'm saying? So it's going to always still. But um, Isaiah 40, verse 8, it says, Isaiah 40, verse 7, I'm going to start there first. It says, the grass withers, the flower fades, because the breath of Yahuwah blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our Elohim stands forever. And that's what I just want to give out. It's going to stand forever. It will never fail that long. Praise God. That's how secure it is. That's how much we we can give our confidence to it. You know, it's never going to fail. Never. You know, that's our rock. That's our foundation. And if we build everything upon that, you know, we can rest assured that we can trust in what the rest of the book, what everything that's written in the pages. If we diagnose it and we analyze it and we bring it all together and we can see that it's a consistent message, you know, all it takes is two or three witnesses to, to establish it, that it's, that it's right. So therefore, this is how I, I believe, you know, as we, as I used to conduct a lot of topical studies, I was noticing that the scriptures really confirm themselves. You know, if you really allow the scriptures to speak, they will tell you what, what, what they want to tell you, and they will confirm one another. And if they don't, then there's something that's been changed. There's something that's been twisted in it, or it doesn't, it's not talking about the same thing. So, you know, when we look at this and we can have confidence in it because we all, we've done our studies and we know that the word is, is, is saying a certain thing in a certain way. Therefore, it doesn't matter what, what the rest of the world is doing or what they're teaching. We have that foundation of the scriptures that we can anchor onto and say, this is what the Father is saying and expects of me. This is the best thing for me and my family. This is how we should live, how we should walk, how we should, you know, exist before our Father, you know, <clears throat> and and therefore, you know, you can have confidence in that. And that's where he's trying to get us to understand that there's, there is set of board, there, there's rules to the kingdom and those that obey it are the ones that are going to engage in it they're the ones that are going to be able to enter into it brother tl shabbat shalom shabbat shalom Ms. Parker. um it just came to my understanding reading this um that in this instance um divorce um from a marriage is being used as an analogy for the separating of uh, people separating themselves from the Torah, saying, uh, saying the Torah is uh, basically done away with. Is that a proper understanding? I would say that it what he's what he's uh, instituting here, if you will, is he's bringing out the prerequisites, if you will, of what are the things that they're missing. But these things are important in the kingdom. Mm -hmm. We can't lose sight of any of them. You know, the, the covetousness of these Pharisees is the first one. You know, we he's linking it. They're 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 what they're doing and what's what's you know what's being revealed in their lives as being not righteous or being unrighteous, if you will. He's also looking at it and he's pointing this out here about divorce and remarriage again because of the importance of, of this topic and you know that it is also part of the commandments, you know. We, do, we don't want to be falling into these into these characters. So he's bringing it into, into our focus that it doesn't matter what part of the Torah it is, that it's going to be harder for the heaven and the earth to pass away for any of this to, to be done away with or to fail or, or, you know, to not have any foundation. So you can hold, and, and he's bringing that in this illustration here. And as we continue on, you're going to be able to see it even more so the reason why he's speaking He's bringing a, a separation or a division, even amongst the, the religious leaders that are supposed to be of Yasserel, right? You know, so you got to you got to think if he's speaking this way, and these are the the religious leaders that are teaching in this in the in the uh, synagogue, you know, and he and he's trying to correct their and and reveal to them what's inside of them, you know, the things that they may not be thinking as as important marriage and divorce well people were groaning and they want to get it so they were probably lackadaisical about it they probably didn't weren't teaching the truth 
but see, he's, he's got it all wound up in, into this Torah. Nothing's going to fail. And he ends it even with the marriage covenant. You know, that's still established. That has not gone away with, you know, even though the people's hearts have failed them and, they, and they've gotten to this point, it doesn't change the fact that Yahuwah's law is what it is or his, his statutes are the way they are, you know, and they're for a reason, you know, so that you will commit to one another. You will choose wisely before you enter into an agreement or an oath or a covenant with somebody, you know, that you're going to be bound to because you don't want to be an adulterer or adulteress because it goes both ways when you're married and you're in that covenant relationship and you just put somebody away without reason, which takes us to the other scriptures that are bound to this same area. You know, we can look at Matthew 5:32. It says, but I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality brings adultery upon her. And he who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. We see it also in first Corinthians seven ten, to marry uh, uh, to the married, I give this command, not I, but Yahuwah. A wife must not separate from her husband. And again, and it goes into 11, the next verses. But if she does, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And a husband must not divorce his wife. You know, he's speaking to the constitution of marriage here. And the, that, that covenant agreement that you have is serious business. You know, so... But they were not, they were not uh, enforcing, if you will, the importance of it is what he's redirecting it to them again, that all these matters that are contained within the Torah are, are, are still, you know, valid. You know, there's still a strong foundation that we need to live our lives according to. So does that help answer your question? Yes, praise you. Um, yeah, I was just speaking uh, to this specific passage. Uh, just the way and, and that it followed behind the uh, uh, the shaman yin and the earth would pass away. Uh, then one of the, one little tittle from the Torah. So it's basically saying that um, you just can't remove any part of the Torah uh, away from the the basura, uh, and say that you still have that you are still uh, following Yahuwah. So I, yeah. then it goes into the divorce of the marriage. I, I understand, um, like you said, the other precepts that goes along with divorce, but I'm just saying specifically, um, he's um, using, using the marriage in this case as, a, as an analogy from divorcing yourself on a tour. Yeah, I think that that's a legitimate view as well. You can see it in that same respect, yeah, you know. You can't, you can't separate none of this, you know, it's, it's binding this, this, this relationship, if you will, with Yahuwah is, is eternal, you know, it's binding, you know, it really, it really does. If you want to give it an analogy, it has teeth, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it is for real, you know, so when you get into it, he's telling us, this is the seriousness of, of the Torah and you getting into this, you, you know, all of these things are involved. And you have to pay attention. Not one of them is going to be removed. You know, uh, we see that there was some things that were fulfilled with Yahusha, with the sacrificial ceremonies, you know, but, you know, he fulfilled them. He completed the requirements of that, but they still, the requirements still there. It's just that it's been fulfilled. You know, it's like paid, you've got that paid on there, you know, uh, so therefore it's been taken care of, but it doesn't change the fact that it's still there, you know, it's still a requirement. And, and you're still going to owe it until it's paid, you know, and that's only through, you know, you know Yahusha, you know, and Yahuwah's forgiveness of that. And so it's, it's interesting how he's tying it all together and he's putting it into a nice little package with a bow on it that says Torah is forever, you know. So <laughs> that's, that's what I see. But, yeah, that's a good analogy. Shabbat shalom and praise Yah. Hello, brother. Thank you. All right, brother Dean. Such a Dean. Uh, Sister Carmen, what you got for us? I know you got something in your head. You... <laughs> Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Um, so um, Luke 16, verse 17, and where it states, and it is easier for the Shamayim and the earth to pass away than for one tittle of the Torah to fall. So that took me to Isaiah, uh, Isaiah 55, 9 to 11, uh, where it reads, for as the heavens, for the Shamayim are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. 
For as the rain comes down and the snow from the Shamayim, and do not return there, but water the earth and make it bring forth and bud and give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So is my word that goes forth from my mouth. It does not return to me empty, but shall do what I please and shall certainly accomplish what I sent it for. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, brother. Yeah, we're on the same page. That also brought that to my mind as well. So thank you for bringing that forward. Brother Paul, Shabbat Shalom, brother. Shabbat Shalom, brother. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Um, yeah, just a lot of this tying together, even um, the conversation before <clears throat> before the study. Um, for me, just on uh, 1615, where he's speaking to the, the Pharisees, um, and he's basically, uh, just let me pull it up, brother. He's basically saying, um, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but Yahuwah knows your hearts. For what, what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of Yahuwah. So he's he's also sort of suggestion, suggesting he knows that they're, they're doing things to be esteemed and, and um, you know, for, for the wrong reasons. And um, it, it makes me think of, a couple of verses, but one which you may initially not see it at first, or why it took me to this verse, but I'll give a little bit of explanation. So James 1, um, so James 1, uh, starting 2, my brethren, count it, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience, but let patience have her perfect work, work that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of Elohim that gives to all men liberally and upbraids not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavers is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let, for let not that man think that he, he shall receive anything of Yahuwah. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So how, how I see this tying in, brother, um, I see myself as a double-minded man, um, but in in Amuna and in fear, you know, I'm, I'm consistently facing big struggles in life, big situations, big circumstances. And I believe, or I pay attention to the world, I pay attention to what's around me, and, and I have that fear. And where he's speaking, um, Yahushua's speaking to them about what's in their hearts, my understanding of the heart is, is what Yahushua refers to as the garden um, in the law of his parables. And I believe that, you know, this is what is meant by, um, you'll know them by their fruits. The, the fruits themselves are sort of what show up in our experience. So in my experience in life, I, I, I face a lot of fearful things and challenging things and everything else, but I, I'm, I'm consistently you know, relying on the Father. So where it ties into our discussion earlier on, something Sister Ina said was it's about our relationship with him. You know, if you notice these words in James, it says, let him ask of Halahim, and then it says, let him ask in faith. So it's consistently always having a relationship with the Father and speaking to the Father for all things in life, for, for not just the struggles, not just the, you know, the easy stuff, the bad stuff, but consistently knowing that he is the one in control of all things and he is the one who can change things. And he is the one in, who empowers you to be able to do anything in this, in this world. So he knows that the, these Pharisees weren't doing that. They, they weren't seeking, you know, consistent uh, guidance and um, asking of Yahuwah because they had their own desires in their hearts and, and it manifested in the way they were, you know, they, they thought they were better than others. They thought they were divided and, and they, they taught what they felt they wanted to teach, but lacked the understanding of what the true meaning of it was and the, and the core principles of the Torah, which were ultimately to love one another and keeping themselves separate in some way was not doing that. Hallelujah. Beautiful core message to love one another and love Allahim. 
first and foremost. You know, with him in the center of it all, you know, no matter what it is you're doing, if you bring him into the middle of it all, you bring him into it, you ask him for advice, wisdom, help. Guess what? He's in the center of it all. He's in the middle of it all. And he's going to begin to direct things. You know, he's going to begin to allow your asking to actually begin to move his hand. Because if you are his child and you're walking in, in his ways, the scripture says pretty clear, you can ask. He says, you have not because you ask not. So we have to get into a, a like was, what was being said earlier, is to be get him in the middle of things and to include him in our lives, you know, to, to ask for direction, ask for wisdom, ask for guidance. He'll give it to you. But, you know, you got to trust enough that you're going to ask. And then you got to look and expect that he's actually going to do it, you know, and not come with a preconceived notion of how he's going to deliver it. Because you don't want to miss it thinking it's going to look like one thing and you and you don't see really what he's sending your way. So, you know, there's wisdom that we have to ask about these things, you know, and. I just love the way that he, you know, he, he's bringing our, our, our thoughts captive as he's doing with the Pharisees. He's allowing them to come and see. He's speaking these truths from the scripture. They can't argue, you know? So therefore he's bringing them back to what's important to the father and what should be important to you and I, to the religious leaders. It's about being consistent and being accurate about what does the father require of you and I, because that's not going to fail. That's that's clean and simple. All right, Brother Charles, well, I see you got your hand back up. What you got? Shabbat Shalom. You can hear me, too? Of course I can. Okay. I just got a kind of a question, then I'll make a statement. Um do you do you think do you think even even when um all is all is done and, and we're dwelling with y'all, you think his law still exists within us? Of course. It's okay. eternal. <laughs> it, it, he's saying here, it doesn't matter if the Shemayin or the earth go away. It doesn't pass. It doesn't fail. It doesn't stop. It's an eternal thing. It's just, it, it's like all of the other things that are laws, if, in, even in our life, in our, in, in our existence, if you will, you know, those things, you know, they, they, they exist. And no matter what, they're going to continue to exist, you know, until all things cease. Well, with Yahuwah's word, it's a different thing. It's an eternal thing. It never stops. You know, it says in, in, in the scriptures also, um, you know, uh, talking about uh, the millennial and what happens uh, after all his judgment is done. And, you know, it tells us what we're going to be doing, that the, 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 the inhabitants of the earth is still going to be doing his, guess what, his sukkot, you know, tabernacles. You know, that doesn't end. You know, if, we're, if, if, if Yahuwah is eternal and he's given us eternal life, why would there a principle that he's established? Why would anything change if it's perfect? Why would anything have to be changed? The things that he's established for you and I in, in, in this earthly realm as our guidelines are because there's, there's things that happen that have to, have, that have, to happen in a certain way. Um, and, and that's why we have this path that we're walking. That's why we have this Torah, you know, in the Brit Hadashah, you know, this book that gives us a direction and says, you're walking through this journey of life. I'm trying to get you to a destination, you know, which is that doorway, you know, that, that we're supposed to walk through, you know, and, and we on this path, he's got us on a journey, you know, and sometimes we don't want to make the journey longer like Yasserel did and have to make it take extra years to get to a destination that shouldn't take us that long. It's because we have to learn from their mistakes so that we don't continue on the same journey, the same you know, path of, of wandering, because we have the information in our hands. We have the ability to, uh, with the Ruach, to teach us and discern how we should live in this day and this age so that, therefore, when we continue on, and we're going to be already be prepared for the kingdom and how we should be handling ourselves there, you know, because it's a spiritual thing when it gets to that. And, you know, even though our, our, our eternity, is, you know, this is another thing that I get that, that kind of, I don't want to get into this discussion today, but, you know, the concept of 
you know, going to heaven and, and people there already. And, you know, that that's where our eternity, that's not what the promise is. It's not, heaven's not our, our promise, you know, eternal uh, earth is our promise, you know, the new earth and the new Shemayim where we all dwell together. He dwells with us here, right? This is the center of it all. This is where we're going to reside with him. So it's, you know, there's so many different misconceptions out there, but I don't want to get off track here. So I'm going to go to you, Brother Dean, to get me back on path. You had me leave. You got something else, Brother Charles? Yeah, I just wanted to say real quick, and the reason why I asked that, because it's funny that the law is being written in your heart. So if it's written in your heart, you want to commit that adultery. But if it, if it isn't in you, then these things move away from you and you and you you don't um you won't be what i would call it won't be in any correction so it's funny how there's a law of gravity and there's a law of electricity because these things keep you grounded and that's the way i've kind of seen it so praise y'all because the um shamayim is within you and um you know so that's what i want to say so praise y'all <laughs> stay grounded brother stay grounded you got a you got a you cool way of wording things, but go ahead, brother Dean. Shalom, shalom. Um, it was just a thought, um, and it was uh, his no, no, his law. Like I just have this image of uh, the two trees in the garden, yeah, and the image I have and the and the thought is that his law is life. His commands are life, um, and. Um, for that reason, that's why it cannot be broken because he is life. Yeah, and when they chose, when the when the when the choice was made, they because remember it was a command, you know, it was a command. So he, he gave life. He spoke life, um, and said, "Hey, this is life, and this is the tree of life. So everything everything that I am is reflected in this tree. Yeah, as an image. Um, but when uh the command was broken it was it was like the umbilical cord was broken um between you know life and life and then as a result we we had the fall um so when i think of his law now um we speak, speak of it as guidelines instructions a way of life but a way of life from life himself it's life it's all life um so yeah um and that made me think about the um, uh, just lined up with what uh, Brother Charles was talking about just now about the Shamaim um, and you know the law, you know the the, the law is it, life. Life will always be present where life is. Life will always be present. Speaking life, expecting life from us. Life bears fruit. Dead things do not bear fruit. So Hallelujah. Well, he is the Elohim of life for sure, and he does give us you know caution about our tongue you know life and death resides in that so you know it's in the word it's in that that intention again is alive within a word you know and it's going to be executed you know that's why we're going to be judged according to our words you know interesting isn't it brother jp yeah, hallelujah. Um, just want to go back and just touch on that i i was like wow you know just the way that verse 18 really magnifies marriage and i believe that what yahushua said when he it, i was reading like the this kind of a similar account but in um the matthew chapter 5 verse 32 and he says but i say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife except for the cause of fornication causes her to commit adultery and whosoever shall marry her that is divorced commits adultery so how how magnificent marriage is um and it's encouraging it's encouraging to to know that when we come into marriage with one another and we become one for me i have a wife we became one with the understanding that there is nothing that we there's nothing to break this except for fornication and how powerful that is that yahuwah because I give esteem to Yahuwah that he brought me and my wife together. And I believe that's what he does for all men and women. But I do, I was just like thinking about that, just the way that 
how it when when the one that does get divorced they now cause others to to sin according to what Yahusha said and I, I was like wow like that is it's just a it's a powerful understanding so that when in a marriage when you're in a struggle or you're going through something tough with your husband or your wife it causes you not to just think about leaving the person but how do we work this out how do we figure this out and so, you know, I just want to encourage all married people, um, when you are, are in that situation, come together with your spouse and sit in prayer together and seek Yahuwah for those answers so that he will make it clean and, and straight. He says, I'll make your path straight. So I just want to encourage that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Definitely a serious conversation we're having today you know there's a, this this isn't an easy scriptures uh to really have to look at and to diagnose what is he really saying and he, he's getting to the heart of the matter of what it what does it take you know what's important in the kingdom all righty well we got 15 minutes let's go ahead and uh see if we can at least get into this uh discussion about the end of this brother jp so let me go ahead and share this we're just going to finish out the rest of this chapter today. All right, if you will. Hallelujah. This is uh, Luke chapter 16, starting verse 19. It says, there was a, rich, a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate, full of sores. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in the grave, he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and sees Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham. Have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in his flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receives, receiveth thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed. So that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that they he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham says unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they would repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Hallelujah. What you get, brother? Well, of course, this is a, <laughs> this is a, a tough one right here, but... You know, not to go into to that area of the doctrine, but just to just to touch on the fact that if we don't, I think for me, the you know, I, I just say this: the, the big the big statement here is that if if one today does not hear Moses and the prophets, they wouldn't even be persuaded if one should rise from the dead and, and come and see them and talk to them. It's how, how much a person's eyes and ears can be closed that they, wouldn't, they couldn't even understand when the word is right in front of them. And how powerful that is. How powerful that is. Hallelujah. Well, I'm going to go ahead and uh, jump into this because this, this is really one of those areas that uh, there's so much depth in this that most people do not see. So, you know, let's... I just want to start by looking at the close. It starts with the rich man. 
and the clothing that he that he's that he's wearing, what that represents, you know, purple, royalty, yeah, fine linens, lived in luxury. Then you have the he calls it the beggar or you know the the poor the poor man named Eleazar, which is the original name, which actually means that um, El is with us. So that uh, you know there's a there's so much more meaning when you look into the actual meanings of these names and in this story and on the surface a lot of people won't get this because they don't know their Tanakh but there's actually this is going to lead us into a whole lot more depth of what he, uh, of what this story is really representing but he's looking at this at this Lazarus if you will or Eleazar you know he's being covered with sores and he's been placed at this rich man's gate you know, uh, and and he's and because he's longing to even just get the crumbs from the rich man's table, you know. So you know, the, the, this this rich man is not giving any food to him, evidently. If he's if he's you know if he's hoping to get crumbs that fell from the rich man's table, you know. But even that, the dogs came and licked up and and and, pr and probably got rid of that, you know. As they're also up here, it says that he came and they licked his sores. You know, it's showing this this person's in a destitute place. But then, you know, it, the story actually shifts and goes into another realm, if you will, where now it becomes a place where this poor man or this beggar died, Lazarus, you know, and he was carried away by the Malachim or the messengers to the bosom of Abraham. Now, there's another clue to us in this story when it talks about Abraham in this story. You know, a lot of it, a lot of people focus on the place, you know, that they, they claim, you know, this and the rich man, you know, he also died and he was buried and, and he and he was put in, you know, and here it says while he is suffering tortures and Sheol, you know, some other translations will have, you know, Hades in there, some will have hell, you know, placed in there, all of that, is, you know, we have to go look past what those words that are placed in there because they all weren't there originally. So what was originally in that place when it was written, you know, and what does that word mean? You know, it takes away all of these different preconceived notions about what we've been taught. This is representing and what this means here, you know, um, but we see that, you know, it's talking about Sheol and this and Hades, and they kind of represent the same thing, the grave, but it's, it's like a holding place, you know, and there's also some descriptions that, you know, that kind of lead my, my thinking and, and, and I don't really talk about, we don't talk about them here, but there's a description in, in, in the book of Enoch about these chambers that are built, that hold, that, that are like high and deep and they're built in the, in the different chambers that separate and divide, you know, the, the good and the bad and even the Malachim and, and all of that. But, you know, that's just using that as an example of what we're seeing here, that there's actually some kind of a place that, that separates and divides those that have passed on, that have died, right? So, and, and, and those that are of the belief, because the, the ones that we're seeing here, they both believe, by the way, because we're going to see that as we continue to go through this story, you know, um, it says here that he was carried away, you know, Lazarus or Eleazar was carried away by the Malachim to Abraham's bosom, which is his chest area. He was being consoled. He was being hugged on. He was being loved on, right? And the rich man also died and he was buried. And while suffering tortures in Sheol, which I don't know that that, that, that tortures in there, uh, but there's like anguish, you know, the, the, those type of things, remorse. There's all these different feelings, the, 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 the weeping and the gnashing of teeth that you hear in scripture. All of these different images that we talk about, you know, are in different places. And a lot of people are trying to blink them all together in, and put them into this scripture where that's not what this is really talking about here. It's not talking about after you, you get judgment and, you, and you're actually placed in, uh, and destroyed or terminated, as the scripture says, the second death. But this is talking about when you're in the grave, you know, before the judgment happens. And we see this, 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 this description of this story where, you know, they both are seeing Abraham, you know, which is the father of, of our Amuna, right? That's what the, uh, the covenant is established with Yahusha is built on this. It's Amuna. It's the, the faith, the belief. 
and that's what we see here. They both had this, and 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 we see that the the, the rich man saw Abraham from afar, and he also seen Eleazar or Lazarus uh, in his bosom, you know, and he began to cry out, the, the father Abraham, he's getting turned. He called him father. There's a term of endearment. He had a he had a recognition. He had a a, a place of honor for this Abraham, um, as he called him father. And he's and he reached out and he says, "Have compassion on me, and send Eleazar to dip his finger in the water and cool my tongue, for I'm suffering in this flame, this torment." You know, and 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 if you think about it, there's a division that's that, that's being described here. But Abraham, he says, "Son, remember that in your life you received good, and likewise Eleazar the evil or the bad. But now he is comforted, and you are suffering." And besides all of this, he says, between us, there's this great chasm. There's this great divide, you know, that has been set so that we can't cross from here to there and you from here to there or from there to here, you know, so we can't do this. So then he realizes that that ain't going to happen. Now his, his, his thoughts start to go to my family. Go warn them. Again, send, send them. Go send them. But the, the story is the same. And as we recognize how many, you know, as we get into the story, I don't think we're going to have time to finish this today. We only got five more minutes, but I want to set the stage for this. This is not a story that most people are going to be thinking about it being tied to, but it's going to reveal a whole lot. And we'll get into that next week. But I want to go ahead and finish laying this foundation here where we see that, you know, he begs that he send him to his father's house to warn his five brothers. And there's a key in that you know, and, 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 and warn them, but he's, he's telling them very simply, they have the Torah, they have the Tanakh, they have the words of Moshe and the prophets, the same as you and I do. So he's given us a warning that it doesn't, there, there's no need to send anybody else. <coughs> they have all that they need. They have the, all the words that they need to hear, and they're not abiding by them. They're not listening to them. And he said, well, you know, and he said, no, no, Father Abraham, if someone from the dead goes and he's telling them, no, that's not going to change it either. Because they're still not going to hear it enough to change their ways. So let's leave it at that, because, you know, as we continue to get into this discussion, which I see that we got a hand up. So I want to go to that. And then we're going to recap this next week, because it gets even more exciting as we get into the depths of really the behind the scenes of this story and what this really represents. Hallelujah. Uh, Silva family. What you got? Hallelujah. I just wanted to bring something out because I've heard it on this platform and on others uh, where sometimes people emphasize that everything in your life has got to be perfect because you are in Yahuwah. This passage clearly states not. He was a beggar. Let that sink in. He was a beggar. Also let it sink in. He was full of sores. Ah. Things were not wonderful. And if people look at it, some people would judge him, which is probably what the rich man was doing while he wouldn't share. He was like, oh, he must have been sinning. That's why. That's not always the case. And I've heard people say that, and that's not always the case. Sometimes Yahoo is putting someone around you to test your heart. Can you be compassionate? Because the rich man was not compassionate to his brother. He just let him sit out there and starve and be hungry and didn't care. And so he reaped the reward of that. But the most important part to hear is it, the situation, which is what I said at the beginning of this study, ain't always what it looked like, man. Yahoo are faithful because that brother suffered, but he ended up in paradise. And he really suffered a lot because of the environment he was in where people with a lack of love and a lack of compassion for their brethren just not caring um so i wanted to point to that because i've heard it several times not just here in other places where people emphasize a lot you know if you're in torah then everything should work out sometimes yes sometimes no because obviously this brother was in torah because he went to rest in paradise but yet he had trials yet he had trials I'll say it one more time yet he had trials the trials is real. And the trials don't mean that I'm not saved. 
The trials don't mean that I'm doing something wrong. The trials are the trials. It is what it is. And it doesn't mean Yahuwah loves you any less. It is the trial. And that brother passed. It, it also can clearly state in the in the passage, he, he must didn't rise up in hostility against his brother because his brother didn't care enough about him to feed him. He just stood there and, and, and waited and suffered. But in the end, he met paradise while the one in luxury met destruction. So I just wanted to bring that out because I think it's important to note that all the time, it doesn't look like how it really is because father had esteemed his brother even though he looked like he was nothing but a beggar and full of sores. Hallelujah. I like your points, but it's going to get a lot deeper. There's going to be a lot more revelation as we get into this further next week. It's not always as it appears um, on the speculation uh, that, that I've actually heard you just say may not be exactly as it is either. So it's going to be interesting as we get into that. I'm excited for that. Uh, we got only got one minute. So Kim uh, from New York, what you got? And then we're going to turn it over to Sister Marshall for announcements. Shalom, everyone. Okay, so my um, my question is um, on the previous verse, um, verse 18. Um, it's about marriage and divorce. So I wanted to know, in terms of marriage, if once someone's uh, once a marriage has been consummated, is there really any reason um, given in scripture for divorce? Because when we look at um, this passage, it brings me back to Matthew chapter one, verses 18 to 19, when Joseph um, wanted to divorce Mary and um, it was divorced, although they were only betrothed. So um, I'm wondering, is there really any reason for, um, for, for given for divorce in scripture um, based on that? Well, according to Matthew, there's only one. For, and, uh, and this is, if you want to say adultery, because once you're married and you have a relationships outside of that marriage, you defile that marriage bed. That would be the only grounds according to Matthew 5.32. So, you know, in this sense of your question, you know, there really is a reason for a divorce and that would be the only one, even though, even in that sense, it's not necessary, you know, that you have a divorce, you know, but that would be the only grounds for it in that sense to break that, the breaking of that covenant. But there's a whole lot more depth of, of, of the actual covenant of marriage as well, um, which we don't have time to get into any of that. So. Anyways, this discussion has been good. I appreciate all your feedback. It's been edifying for today. And I look forward to continuing next week. I think it's going to be great. So Shabbat Shalom, everyone. All righty, sister.